So good morning, it's the time for our lecture number 12. So last time we have derived the linearized version of the Einstein equations, uh, assuming that the metric is flat plus a small perturbation. Uh, if you, uh, this takes a bit of time, but in the end you obtain a linear system of part partial differential equations for the perturbation expressed in the terms of the flat background metric. Uh, this is a very much a coordinate dependent co uh, construction. Uh, we neglect all quadratic terms in H. Uh, we have a bit of a choice of the coordinates X mu in which we express the metric. Uh, yeah, and we have found the simplest possible form of the resulting e equations, namely, if we introduce the trace reversed perturbation, so this quantity over here, the raising of indices here is done with the flat metric eta. If we additionally impose the gauge, Lorentz gauge condition, it turns out you can always satisfy it by appropriately just adjusting the coordinate system. Then we end up with relatively simple uh, equations for this trace reversed perturbation. Basically the wave equation, the box operator acting of H on H bar is minus 16 p g stress energy tensor. And we also discussed the Newtonian limit, which you can obtain from that. If you assume that the stress energy tensor is dominated by T0,0, the mass density and the energy current and pressure are negligible. If you assume that the velocities are also not relativistic with respect to some kind of frame in which we perform the calculations, then it turns out that the equations reduced to one scalar equation. The metric has this familiar Newtonian form. You, we basically, the, there is one uh, additional function appearing in, on, uh, over the diagonal. And this scalar function satisfies the familiar Poisson equation. And that's how we show that uh, in appropriate limiting sense, we can recover the Newtonian theory uh, from general relativity. Okay. Now, uh, in the next part of the lecture, I would like to consider a little bit the, the case when this potential is completely independent of time. So we got some kind of time symmetry in our space time um, because there's very interesting physical phenomena related to that. Uh, but in order to do it, I would like to touch another topic. Uh, that is the problem of symmetries and queuing vectors of space times. Uh, so space times may have symmetries, uh, and here I mean continuous symmetries, something like a translational symmetry. You translate your your, your space time in a particular direction, or maybe with respect to time, and it turns out that it remains uh, unchanged, like this one over here. So we may have a translational symmetry. We take our manifold, we translate it in a particular direction, and it turns out that it does not change its shape. It can be a rotational type of symmetry, like the one you see over here. Um, there is a symmetry with closed loops. If we rotate our, our space time with respect to an axis, it does not change its form. Uh, just as any other physical systems, the space time itself may have symmetries. And symmetries are good because they simplify the physical treatment and the calculations in physical systems. Uh, how do you recognize a symmetry? So we can simply assume that our coordinate system is adapted to a symmetry. Namely, there is one particular coordinate number alpha. It can be, for example, zero in case of, of time symmetry, uh, such that in, in, in this coordinate frame, the uh, all components of the metric uh, are constant or, or differentiated by uh, this particular coordinate alpha give you zero. So for example, the metric components are independent of time, which corresponds to alpha hat equal to zero. Hat means here that we are not discussing all possible values of alpha, but rather there is a particular value of alpha for which this is true. So we can treat this as a signature of a space-time symmetry. But this, of course, this uh, construction is coordinate dependent. I'm, I'm using green color for that. Uh, it turns out that it's also very useful to have an coordinate independent version of the statement. Um, oh, let me just mention that it's pretty obvious that it's coordinate dependent. Think about the Minkowski space time. In the standard coordinates, the 
components of the metric are constant, in particular constant in time. So this derivative is zero, but we have also found out that in a different coordinate system, the one we have derived in the problem sheet three, uh, the metric acquires an additional term over here, which is basically tau squared, where tau is the new time. So in this new coordinate system, the metric does not appear to be, uh, to have any time-like symmetry. But that's an illusion because we're looking at the metric in a very unusual coordinate frame, coordinate system. Nevertheless, it's clear that if you want to see a symmetry, you have to adjust your coordinate system to that. But you might want to define symmetries in a way which does not make use of, a, of an appropriately adapted coordinate system. And this is where the uh, notion of the queuing vector comes uh, in. So in this coordinates, let's assume first that we are back in the coordinate system adapted to our symmetry. Uh, alpha is the number of component in, in which the, the space-time or the manifold we're discussing is symmetric. We define k mu to be the vector composed of just zeros and one at the position corresponding to alpha or k mu equal to delta mu alpha hat. That's a Kronecker delta. And we say that this vector generates this symmetry, meaning uh, if we take a point and let it follow the vector field as if it was a velocity field of a fluid, this will simply generate our translation or, or our deformation, our map of the symmetry, which, which preserves the, the, the metric. Now, it turns out that if we define k mu this way, and if indeed the metric is uh, constant with respect to the uh, to this coordinate alpha, then we have the following equation, uh, the covariant derivative of k mu nu plus the, the covariant derivative of k mu with mu, that's just supposed to, that must be equal to zero. This is known as the queuing equation. But this also works the other way around. If we find a non, trivial non-vanishing solution of this equation over here. So this equation always has this, the trivial solution of k mu equal to zero component by component, but that's not interesting. If we find a non-vanishing one, and then we can find a coordinate system, which is in which uh, k mu takes exactly this form over here for some number alpha. And in that case, it's easy to show that the derivative of mu nu with respect to this alpha is equal to zero. So this equation over here, in fact, characterizes space-time symmetries uh, as well as the, as the condition over here. But this equation is covariant, it's tensorial, it's coordinate independent. So the proper way to think about uh, symmetries of a space-time in a coordinate independent manner is to think about this vector satisfying the queuing equation. They're also known as queuing vectors. And if you're curious, the name does the name comes from the name of a German mathematician, I think Victor Keeling or Wilhelm Keeling uh, from early 20th century. Mm. So basically, Keeling vectors are rare beasts. If you take a generic space time with no additional expressions, you just write down whatever expressions for the metric components, it's extremely likely that the this metric is not going to have any symmetries at all. So the only possible solution of the Keeling equation is just k equal to zero, a trivial one. Or in other words, space-time for which there is a Keeling vector are rather special, symmetric. Uh, it's possible to show that the solutions of the Keeling equation form a finite dimensional vector space. There, is, there can be infinitely many of them. Uh, in dimension four, the, the largest numbers of independent Keeling vectors is 10, and this is the number of Keeling vectors in the Minkowski spacetime. Uh, since the topic of Keeling vectors is important, I would like to first prove this theorem over here on the blackboard, and then we'll talk a little bit about Keeling vectors and uh, geodesics. But do you have any questions to the topic of Keeling vectors? Okay, I don't hear any, so I will share the blackboard. Mm. 
the new topic is healing vectors. Mm. So we are supposed to show that uh, if we have d over d x alpha for a particular alpha g mu nu equal to g mu nu alpha, just the same thing equal to zero. And if we define k mu to be a vector with the only non-vanishing component being one in the direction of alpha hat, then we have this equation over here. And we work here, we work in an adapted coordinate system. In the one in which this is true. So, uh, we certainly know that the covariant derivative in any direction is equal to zero, but that is also simply g mu nu in the direction of alpha minus gamma sigma nu alpha g sigma nu minus gamma sigma alpha g mu sigma. Uh, from our assumptions, this was supposed to be equal to zero. So it follows that gamma sigma nu alpha g sigma nu plus gamma sigma nu alpha hat g mu sigma, that's zero. So this condition over here is equivalent to the one over here. And now the killing equation. So the killing equation tells the killing equation nabla mu k mu plus nabla mu k mu. That's Let's write it this way, d mu k mu minus gamma sigma mu mu k sigma minus gamma sigma mu mu k sigma. Uh, but this is nothing else but eta alpha bar sigma. Because that's just lowering the index of this guy over here. So this is uh, and this is also something like that. Uh, alpha not sigma but mu. So here we are differentiating this thing over here, but this is a constant. Eta is, is a constant matrix. So the first term is zero. And now here, what we get is minus gamma sigma mu mu eta alpha bar sigma minus gamma sigma mu mu eta alpha bar sigma. Oops, sorry, what we get here is G. Okay, sorry, now I see that my proof over there was wrong. Okay, so let's do it again. K mu is simply G mu 
alpha, which is not constant. And equal to g mu alpha. Okay. That's equal to d mu g mu alpha minus gamma. Uh, sigma mu mu g sigma alpha minus gamma uh, plus d mu g mu alpha minus minus gamma sigma mu mu G sigma alpha. Uh, by assumption, this okay. This thing over here is nabla mu g mu alpha plus gamma rho. Mu, mu g rho alpha plus gamma rho. So I'm trading the standard derivative for a covariant derivative here. Gamma rho alpha mu g mu rho minus gamma sigma mu mu g sigma alpha uh, plus the same thing with mu and mu reversed and now we discover that this is zero by definition this thing over here and this thing over here cancel out. Meaning that we're left with gamma sigma alpha bar mu g mu rho plus the same with mu and the mu reversed. And now, if you look carefully, it's the same expression as we see over here. So, this thing over here is the same as this thing over here. Uh, but what does this mean? Well, this means that g mu mu alpha is equal to zero. This is equivalent to this thing, and this is equivalent to this thing, which is in turn equivalent to this thing over here. Plus nabla mu mu equals to zero. Okay, so in the particular coordinate system in which we we uh, have introduce here one in which the derivative component by component of the metric with respect to x alpha is zero. In that coordinate system, this condition is equivalent to the killing vector given by this thing here, k being a killing vector over here. Uh, what we have not shown is that given a killing vector, we can indeed find a coordinate system in which uh, k mu has this form but we will not do it here. It's, uh, it's it's not really all that interesting and important. Okay. Do you have questions to this to this proof? Sorry, I had this bit of a mistake in my in my notes. I had to correct it, but fortunately, the proof turned out not to be that difficult. Okay. Let's go to the next. 
Page. Now, the next topic is healing vectors and geodesics. So obviously the fact that we have a symmetry of the spacetimes help us with understanding the geodesics in a given spacetime in a number of ways. The first is very simple. If our metric is independent with respect to independent of time, so we've got g mu nu equals a derivative with respect to zero equal to zero, then if we solve the geodesic equation once, so we've got a curve x mu of lambda, then we can consider the same curve, exactly the same curve, uh, this would be t or x0 and this would be xi. We can consider exactly the same curve translated a little bit into the future or into the past. Or even later into the future. And each of these curves will be a solution, obviously, because we have time invariance. So we can consider, instead of x mu, we can consider uh, x0 of lambda plus some constant, x1 of lambda, x2 of lambda, x3 of lambda. And for each c, this will also be a, a, a geodesic if the initial curve was a geodesic. So we can generate a whole series of geodesic just up, out of one, simply because we have time translational symmetry. The same with rotational symmetry. If we could rotate our system uh, around an axis, then any solution of the geodesic equation can also be rotated and the rotated curve will correspond to another geodesic. But that's not the only way in which healing vectors and symmetries help us. You may remember from your, from your classical mechanics course, or from a quantum mechanics course, that if your system has a symmetry, then it also has a conserved quantity. And this is also true in general relativity. So symmetry, continuous symmetry, implies a killing vector. In fact, there's a relation in both directions. And this implies conserved quantities. in geodesics. So if x mu of lambda is your geodesic, we define the tangent vector to be dx mu over d lambda. Then k mu t mu is equal to constant along a geodesic. Uh, this is a simple fact, and we will prove it in a second. Uh, do you have any questions to this topic? Uh, I have one. Yes, go yeah. on. Uh, so the thing is that when you say, uh, let's say, for example, over here, we are considering the killing vector along time. Yes. So this simply means that the solutions which will be generated via this condition mm -hmm. uh, will be static solution, right? Yes, it's uh, exactly. This is a, simply a different name. Okay, there is one more condition for this um, for this to be true. Uh, a solution is called static when you one has a time like key vector, but there is another condition also we, we need to satisfy. But yes. Uh, okay, so like then to have something which is dynamical, we can't have this as a killing vector then, right? Uh, in a sense, yes. If if you have a killing vector, then you have a perfect symmetry in a particular direction. And in, if this is a, a symmetry corresponding to a time-like direction, then we have a perfect time-like symmetry. Nothing is changing. Uh, okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah. So killing vectors also help us in the following way. Uh, for killing, for a... Uh, 
for geodesic, we can be sure that the product of the tangent vector with the queuing vector is going to be constant. And of course, conserved quantities help us with solving the differential equations. Uh, we will see the application of that soon. But now let's prove this thing over here. Uh, yeah, so we calculate What's the problem? I don't understand. So. So we calculate the derivative along the geodesic of this quantity, k nu, k nu. And that's basically the same thing as calculating the covariant derivative in the direction of t, or T sigma, nabla sigma, of this product, or of, of this contraction. We can use the uh, rule for product times T nu plus K nu nabla T, T nu. Okay, first the second term. This thing over here is just equal to zero because of the geodesic equation. By definition, a geodesic is a, is a curve for which this thing vanishes, the derivative of t in the direction of t. Now, the first thing over here, we can also write it as the product t mu, t mu, nabla mu, a mu. Okay, so now let's go back to the killing equation. We take it product twice with, we, we take its product with T mu nu uh, and the contraction over here. And what we get is T mu, T mu, nabla mu, a mu plus T mu, T mu, nabla mu, a mu. Uh, by renaming the index mu to mu and mu to mu, we just get two nabla mu k mu t mu mu. But if k is killing, then this is zero. But if this is the case, then this whole thing is zero. So this is zero because of the killing equation. So the derivative of the product of the queuing vector and the tangent vector is zero. So this is a constant along each particular geodesic. Any questions to the proof? Okay, I don't see any. So now the next topic is energy conservation in time independent metrics. So as you can guess, uh, if, t mu, if k mu corresponds to time translation, we will, uh, we will identify the conserved quantity with the energy. So now energy conservation. We're in the Newtonian limit. So the metric is again, uh, minus one plus two phi dt squared plus dx one squared dx two squared plus dx three squared multiplied by one minus two phi. And we assume that phi the potential is just a function of the position, not of time. This way, it's obvious that d over dt of g mu nu is zero, or that the vector k mu equal to one, zero, zero, zero is a killing vector. 
Okay, if that is the case, then let's calculate the product of the four momentum of a particle with the queuing vector. That's P mu G mu mu K mu. That's P mu. Uh, okay, what happens when we lower this index over here? We get K mu. And this k lower index nu, uh, it will have the component minus one minus two phi zero zero zero. Uh, so calculating this product, we see that only the p zero component satisfies, uh, survives, and we've got one phi zero minus one minus two phi. And we will call it minus the energy. Okay, let's go to the next page. So the energy, which is nothing else but minus the lower zero component, which is just minus P mu K mu, which is equal to one plus two phi P zero. This is conserved uh, when the motion is geodesic. Okay, but now let's assume we've got a static observer. A static observer is an observer uh, with who whose whose for velocity is aligned with k mu. So it's an observer uh, who does not move with respect to this vector generating the symmetry. Remember that u mu uh, the for velocity needs to be normalized. So in other words, we can write that u mu is just the queuing vector, but with a normalization factor. Mm, that's k mu. What's this product over here? Let's go back to the previous slide. Uh, the product of k with itself is just minus one minus two phi. Okay, but we can also write it as k mu Uh, one minus phi. I'm using the expression that one over one plus square root of x, that's one minus x to oh, x squared, the Taylor expansion of, of this function over here. Okay, so that's the four velocity of a static observ observer. Now, what is the energy measured by the static observer. So we've got a body, it can be a, uh, a massive body, it can be a photon, and we let the static observer measure its energy. E observed, that's minus P mu, U mu, the four velocity of the static observer. And that's minus P mu K mu one minus phi. Uh, and that's that thing over here is this conserved energy. Let's write it as E one minus phi. Or in other words, the conserved energy is the E observed one plus phi, plus terms of the order of phi squared. Okay, 
this looks a bit strange, but let's let's try to write this thing in, in some special cases. Special case one, slowly moving massive particles. In this case, the observed energy, well, that's basically M0, the, the energy of, the, of this thing, plus M0 V square over two in local, in a local initial frame um, connected to the uh, static observer. V is the velocity and there is higher order terms as well. So the conserved energy conserved, the one which is conserved during the motion, well, that's this times one, so m plus m zero v square over two plus phi times this whole thing. But look, this is m zero c squared. This is about this is certainly a bigger number than this one. So we will neglect the product of phi with this thing here because it's very small, and we got phi times m zero. And you see we discover the conserved energy of a mass of particles in a gravitational field, because this thing over here is just the uh, potential energy in this gravitational field given by the potential. So this whole thing here, if the, if the potential is static, then this is conserved. And that's very nice, that's what we expect. Uh, we can also go back to the coordinate system, to the coordinate, uh, to the unit system, which C is not equal to one, and then this is just M zero C squared, a large const but constant term, the kinetic energy much smaller than this than this thing over here, plus phi M zero, which is the potential energy. Okay, so this is special case one, slowly moving massive particle. We discovered that the conservation of energy in this case is just the conservation of the standard mechanical energy. But let's consider a special case two, that is photons. So now we consider a photon in a gravitational field. In that case, the observed energy, which is H bar times the observed frequency, that's uh, minus P mu, U mu. And the conserved energy, well, that's the mm, observed uh, plus phi e observed, that's one plus phi h omega observed. So we see that the frequencies of, of the photon is not conserved during its motion because what is conserved is the product of the, the frequency of, of a given photon and one plus phi. And if the potential varies, so will the uh, registered frequency. Now, a particular example, we have two observers. Static at two different points. Mm. And there is a potential difference between them. So phi two not equal to phi one. For example, we've got a tower in the Earth's gravitational field. We've got an observer over here who measures the frequency of a photon going downwards. And we've got another observer who performs the same measurement over here. That's number one and number two. What kind of frequency do they see, omega one and omega two? Well, the, we can assume that the Earth's gravitational field is static, so this will be conserved. So one minus 
1 plus phi 1 h omega 1 must be equal to 1 plus phi 2 h omega 2. So omega 1 divided by omega 2, that's supposed that will be the uh, 1 plus phi 2 divided over 1 plus phi 1. But that's almost 1 plus phi 2 minus phi 1, which is 1 minus delta phi, the difference of, of the potentials. But that's, and if we go back, now this is potential, this is the dimensionless potential expressed in dimensionless units, if we go back to the, to the dimensional one, what we get is minus delta phi, uh, let's say old divided by c squared. So obviously there is a difference between the frequency of the same photon falling down uh, as registered by the first observer and as the second observer. More precisely, uh, since the first observer uh, has higher has a higher potential than the second one. So phi one is larger than phi two. Then this is a negative number. This delta phi this delta phi is a negative number, and because of that, this number is larger than one. And because of that, uh, wait a second. Yeah. Yeah, so phi one is larger than one plus phi two. So this is an this is all a negative number. So delta phi is positive. So this is smaller than one. So omega one is smaller than omega two. In other words, the observer standing. Uh, on the bottom of the tower sees the frequency larger than the one uh, that that measures the frequency on the top of the tower. So we assume that phi one is larger than phi two. So we have uh, one plus phi two minus phi one. That is less than one. So omega one is less than omega two. In other words, uh, the uh, observer uh, at the bottom of the tower sees the photon blue shifted with respect to uh, the observer one on top of the tower. And that makes sense. The photon falls in the gravitational field, acquires a bit of energy, and, and the second observer sees that. This is the gravitational redshift. It's obviously a very different phenomenon than the Doppler red, redshift or blue shift because both of these observers are assumed to be strictly static. It's just the difference of the gravitational potential which causes the difference of frequencies. Okay, let me go back to the slides. Uh, do you have any questions to this derivation, by the way? I don't see any, so let me go back. So, yeah, this is again a short look at the situation we we have derived. So we've got two guys standing on a tower. One of them is basically cosplaying Galileo and dropping uh, material objects downwards. As as the object falls down, it acquires gravitational it acquires energy. Uh, it loses gravitational energy but acquires kinetic energy. Its velocity increases and 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 this this happens all the way until it reaches the bottom. Uh, the other guy has got a laser pointer. It's shooting a laser downwards. Now, uh, photons always propagate with the speed of light. They cannot attain, uh, they cannot acquire larger velocity, but they can acquire energy and became increasingly blue shifted. And this is what is happening over here. And that's basically the effect, the derivation of the effect uh, I have presented just a second ago. I assume that the guy on the top is emitting the photon and the observation is performed here uh, in the base of, uh, at the base of the tower. Uh, 
if the gravitational field is roughly constant along the way, which is almost always the case in, in case of Earth-based experiments, we can easily uh, approximate the difference between the potential by the momentary derivative, which is just the gravitational acceleration and the difference of, of the height between or altitude of, of these two observers uh, divided by c squared. Uh, unfortunately, this is a very small effect on Earth. Again, we've got c squared, the, the square of the speed of light in the denominator, which makes the effect very small. And indeed, for a one meter dis difference, uh, the frequency change or the gravity induced blue shift is just 1.1 10 to minus 16 uh, of, of relative change of frequency per one meter. And if you look at the corresponding Doppler effect, this is the Doppler effect of the same magnitude is something you, you get for the velocity of 10 to minus six centimeters per second. So that's around three micrometers per second. And because of that, you see the fundamental problem with measuring this effect on earth. It's very small, and if you just try to measure it using um, any kind of apparatus you hold in your hands, the bare shaking of your hands produces a vastly larger Doppler effect than the frequency change because of the gravity. Uh, if you're, for example, measuring the frequency of, of light coming from, I don't know, a lamp you have in the ceiling. So it takes, it took a bit of time until people learned to measure this, other people measured this effect. It, it was measured and it's measured routinely quite precisely nowadays, but it's not a simple task. Uh, you have to somehow get around the much larger Doppler effect type of things. Uh, this effect is larger for the sun and you can check yourself that uh, for photons emitted by the photosphere of the or the outermost layer of the sun, uh, the frequency shift is around, the gravitational frequency shift is around 10 to minus six when you measure it on earth very far away. And this corresponds to 600 meters per second, which is not that small of a number. So let me tell you a few things about the history of the measurements. So the first Earth-based measurement of this effect by Pound and Repka, and later by Repka and Snyder was performed in 1960s. Uh, it was basically done the way you see you see over here. Uh, I think it was done in Harvard, if I remember correctly. Uh, gamma photons coming from uh, from radioactive from the decay of radioactive nuclei of I think iron uh, were basically dropped from from not quite a tower but rather from a tall building, uh, and their frequency was measured very precisely using so so, so called Mesbauer effect about twenty meters below. Uh, the measurement was not at the time terribly precise, but it at least it, it allowed to confirm that the effect was there. A much more precise measurement was done using gravity probe A, that was a rocket-based experiment. So uh, the idea was to compare the, the frequency of two hydrogen masers. Hydrogen masers at that time were probably the most stable type of, of oscillators giving very precise, uh, giving very stable frequencies. Uh, one of them was uh, on the board of a rocket, which was uh, which was launched into the space uh, to the altitude of, of ten thousand kilometers, and there was a link between the uh, Earth base station, a microwave link between Earth base station and the rocket, and then back from the rocket uh, to the station. Uh, the trick was to perform a two-directional comparison. So first of all, the signal from from the rocket was sent back to Earth. Uh, it contained the gravitational uh, the gravitational blue shift on top of the much larger Doppler redshift. Uh, but there was also another type of measurement going on at the same time. So the signal from the hydrogen maser on, on Earth was was uh, uh, was sent from the Earth to the rocket. In the rocket, it was then sent back via transport transponder. A transponder is almost like like a mirror. Uh, back uh, back to the Earth, and then compared with the original maser. The second signal contained twice the the Doppler redshift, but on the other hand, the gravitational part cancelled out exactly because you've got because basically the uh, signal from the Earth based maser made a round trip first to ten thousand kilometers and then back to the Earth. 
And because of that, by comparing these two frequency measurements, it was possible using a, a kind of differential measurement to measure the pure gravitational signal. Uh, at the same time, astronomers managed to measure the solar gravitational redshift, which is not that trivial because uh, unfortunately uh, in, on, on, the, uh, on the sun, uh, the plasma undergoes very strong motions in the, in the vertical direction in, in the photosphere. The trick was to perform the measurement mainly in the near the solar limb, uh, where the uh, the uh, Doppler effect is, is is the smallest. Now uh, nowadays, this effect can be measured in a yet different way, uh, using ultra precise atomic clocks. And so modern atomic clocks uh, are super precise devices. They are so precise that it's absolutely possible to measure. Uh, this 10 to minus 16 or even smaller different on, or even smaller effect. So if you place your precise atomic clock on the desk and another one on the floor, it's absolutely possible to measure the frequency difference. Uh, basically, you need to connect the clocks using some kind of optical fiber or uh, electronic cable and compare the frequencies. Strictly speaking, this is a bit of a different situation than we are discussing here because this is not a free fall of a photon from one clock to the other, but rather the photon travels in, an, for example, optical fiber. But it turns out that it doesn't really matter. You get the same results, even, even if this is not, strictly speaking, a free fall. Another place where the uh, gravitational redshift and blue shift is important is the GPS system. So the GPS system, the global positioning system, is a system of satellites which send radio signals uh, it's a constellation of, of satellites sending uh, signals. Each of the satellites has a very precise atomic clock on its board and sends appropriate signals uh, all around the globe in all possible directions, identifying the satellite, its orbital element, and the uh, and the frequency and the uh, uh, and also uh, the moment as measured by the clock. Now. Uh, in order to make the system work, you have to account, you need to make sure that the uh, frequencies of these clocks match the frequencies of the clocks on Earth. This requires an appropriate tuning of each of these atomic clocks, and this tuning has to take into account the Doppler effect, but also the gravitational red and blue shift. A very interesting and unintended measurement of the gravitational frequency shift was performed on the other hand by the European Global Navigation System called Galileo. So in 2000, I think 13 or 12, uh, two new satellites were launched to this constellation with very precise atomic clocks. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the rocket which was sending these satellites malfunctioned uh, along the way. Uh, the satellites were launched, but not quite to the right orbit or more precisely, the orbit that they, they, they managed to reach was at relatively large eccentricity, 0 0.16. That's a bit too much for these satellites to be to be useful. Nevertheless, the satellites were functioning very well, and they were sending their periodic signals from, from an atomic clock uh, using radio waves. Now, it turned out that this is a nice opportunity to measure the gravitational frequency shift, because zero point, eccentricity is 0 0.16 of the orbit simply means that the uh, that the satellites were changing their altitude with respect to the, to the Earth uh, as they were orbiting the Earth with the period of, I think, hours. And that's great. It means that uh, by comparing the, 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 the apparent frequency of the, by comparing the frequency of the signal obtained from these satellites on Earth, at different moments of its orbital orbit, it was it was possible to measure very precisely the gravitational frequency shift. Uh, if you are interested in this type of experiments, there is a very nice uh, longer article about the confrontation between GR and experiment in uh, Living Reviews in Relativity. By the way, I strongly recommend this journal. It's 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 a journal about general relativity and all its aspects, theoretical, experimental. Uh, and it consists of longer review articles with excellent uh, with excellent uh, list of links to uh, more precise and deeper literature. Okay, I think it's already 9.59. Do you have any questions to the gravitational frequency shift?
Okay, if you don't, then we can have 10 minutes of break. So it's 10, let's meet at 10 minutes past 10. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, it's time for the second part of our lecture. I will share the screen. So the next topic we'll talk about will be the gravitational line bending and the equations of motion in the uh, in the Newtonian approximation. And let's go to the blackboard number six. So the topic is equations of motion. And gravitational line light, light bending. Yeah, so recall that the metric in the Newtonian approximation is minus one plus two phi to p squared plus one minus two phi to x squared plus the y squared plus z squared which we can also write as minus dt squared plus dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. And that's basically the flat metric. Uh, and a perturbation minus two phi dt squared plus dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared, and that's what we call h mu nu dx mu dx mu. We have also calculated, in fact, we did it a couple of lectures ago, the non-vanishing Christopher symbols. I A and finally gamma I J K purely special components that's phi I delta J K plus phi J delta I K minus phi K delta I J. Okay, so we can write the geodesic equation. In terms of, of e mu, the four momentum. And it simply states that d p mu over d lambda plus gamma mu alpha beta, d alpha p beta, that's zero. Uh, we can decompose this into this zero and the spatial components. And for the zero component, we get dp zero over d lambda plus gamma zero zero k p zero p k equals to zero. Uh, with a factor of two. Uh, or dp zero over the lambda is equal to minus two p zero dk by k. And then we've got the spatial ones, which reads d p i over d lambda. I will not attempt to derive everything term by term. Minus p j p k delta j k phi i plus two phi j p j p i. Yeah, and that's it. 
Mm, now for a massive particle, just to remind you, we can do two things. Instead of d over d lambda, we can use d over d tau, the proper time. Uh, and that's related by an M0 over here. And if we assume that velocities are small, so pk, pj, and this type of quadratic terms uh, are small, we uh, we neglect terms which are quadratic in spatial uh, components of, in for, of four momentum. What we get is just dp0 over p tau is equal to minus phi uh, minus two p zero uk phi k uk is the for velocity or in this case simply the spatial velocity vk and this gives the energy conservation the one we derived before uh, there is and then we've got the spatial component, which is kind of trivial. That's minus phi i m zero. Uh, okay, so that's what you get for a massive particle. Now, what about a photon? Let's have a look at. Let's have a closer look at the geodesic equation for a photon. Obviously. The massive massive particles feel the gravitational field in the sense that they feel the derivative of the uh, gravitational potential. What about the null geodesics? Well, we can expect that they will feel the, the, job, the differences in potential as well. Obviously, the, the energy changes, but what about the trajectory? Okay, so we assume that the for momentum, p mu, we will approach this problem perturbatively. So we've got the zero of order solution corresponding to pure uh, space uh, p mu, uh, to, to the flat space. And in that case, p zero mu is a constant equal to some kind of p zero zero, zero zero, p zero zero. Uh, our photon propagates in the direction of z uh, when it is not perturbed. But if we switch on the uh, perturbing potential, we also need to include this p1, and we will check what this p1 is. Mm. So first of all, we have to impose that p mu, p mu, g mu nu is equal to zero, which means that P zero mu plus P one mu P zero mu. This is of the order of H and this is of the order of zero. Uh, this should be mu times eta mu nu plus H mu nu. This must be zero. Uh, It turns out that what happens is that the full P0 must be equal to the square root of the I zero PJ zero 
delta i j times one minus four i. Okay, now the Jodas equation. Since we already know what is happening with the energy, we, we just focus on the spatial part. So we've got the dPi over d lambda. Mm, that's minus phi i k pl delta kl minus phi i p naught squared plus phi j p i j So obviously the photons also feel the pull of the gravitational field. Mm. Okay, so here we we have phi everywhere in every term of, of the right-hand side. So according to our perturbative approach, we are, we are perfectly allowed to use just the zero order term uh, momentum here. So this is just minus phi i p zero k p zero l delta k l minus phi i p zero zero squared uh, plus two phi phi j p zero i p zero j okay uh, this is constant because if there is no perturbation if we switch off the perturbation the photon just follows a straight line and p u is conserved component by component what about phi i so at the zero of the order uh, this is supposed to be null and if this is the case, then P zero K P zero L times the spatial metric data KL, that's supposed to be P zero zero squared. That's the null condition of this on imposed on the zero of order solution, which means that this and this guy are entirely equal. this guy and this guy. You can represent them together as minus two phi i e zero zero squared plus two phi j e zero i e zero j. We're close to the final form. Uh, I will now do one thing. I will factor out minus two pi zero squared from both of these terms. So the zero component of the zero of the order uh, for momentum of the photon. And in that case, I'm left with, and I will also factor out phi j. And in that case, what I get is something like this over P zero zero P zero zero phi J. Okay. And that's the expression I was looking for. 
this one over here. Now, what does it mean? You see, the bottom line is that there is the gradient of phi here. And then this gradient of phi is contracted with this thing over here. And this thing over here is nothing else but the projection operator to the transverse direction of motion, the transverse directions. So in the spatial components, we've got the direction of motion uh, aligned with PI, or in this particular case, uh, with the Z direction. And this thing here is the projection to the two other uh, transverse components, X and Y, this thing over here. So this is nothing else but the gradient of phi, but only in the directions perpendicular to the direction of motion. And then we've got minus 2 P0 squared uh, over here. So we are now ready to uh, look more carefully uh, how variations of phi affect the uh, direction of propagation in a particular situation, because we see that they will. There is a, a kind of deflecting, um, the, the, this geodesic equation uh, predict some kind of deflection just because of the emergence of gradient in the transverse directions. So gravitational deflection of light. So we will look at a particular setup in which we have a massive body. I uh, will use this reddish color for that. So this is a body of mass M. We've got our light, right? In the absence of this body, it would simply propagate along the straight line. But here, there is a bit of a deflection. The deflection happens basically during the, the encounter of the, of the photon and the mass. Uh, before that and after that, the photon is basically free. It propagates along a straight line or very close to a straight line. Uh, yeah. The impact parameter B measures how close the photon gets to the body, the deflecting body. And we also define the deflection angle. might be in this direction, right, but in this direction, and this will be called theta. Okay. Before the deflection, the photon has momentum P equals to zero, zero P Z. After the deflection, it acquires also a component in the direction of X. And it's easy to see that this, let's call it delta theta. Or not delta, just theta. It's easy to see that minus PX over PZ, that's the tangent of theta of the deflection angle which for very small angles is just theta. We assume that the body creates a gravitational potential, phi equal to, no surprise here, minus G capital M over R. And the photon encountered this spherically symmetric potential and got deflected. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so we calculate the rate of change of the X component. So the X axis is over here, the Z axis is over there. And we calculate the derivative of the X component here. And according to our formula, this is just the derivative in the X direction times Z squared.
Mm. We can call it P0 Z, the one uh, the the photon had originally. And X is perpendicular to the direction of propagation, so the projection operator doesn't act here. It doesn't do anything here. Uh, then we calculate one over p zero z squared dpx over d lambda. That is one over p zero z d over d lambda dx over p zero z p zero z is just the energy or the momentum of the photon uh, in its motion initially and that is going to be well minus two phi x there's no square here this thing over here is just the derivative not with respect to z it's as if in, instead of parametrizing our curve with the affine parameter lambda connected with, with P, we parametrize it with uh, the value of, of Z, of the Z component. So on the, okay, so PX D over DZ, PX over P, not z that's minus two pi x okay and now we have to use the formula for the uh, uh, we use the formula for the potential we assume that the origin of the of our coordinate system is at, at the center of this mass. So this is phi. In this case, we need the derivative with respect to x of this guy, and this is g um, x. x squared plus y squared plus z squared the power of three half mm, yeah check yourselves uh, more precisely we are interested in the value of d over d phi along the unperturbed geodesic and the unperturbed geodesic is basically the curve of x equal equals to b and y equal to zero. And in that case, this is just g um, b over b squared plus z squared to the power of three, two. Okay. And in that case, initially px was equal to zero, so px is just over p zero z is just the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity. We assume that we perform the measurement very far away from the mass and we begin our, our motion very far from the mass as well. Uh, of minus two g m p. divided by z squared plus b squared b z. Okay, so in the end, the formula amounts to just an integral and there is a power of three, two here. Uh, with a bit of algebraic manipulation and change of variables, we can also manipulate this integral into minus 2gm over b. 
integral from minus infinity to plus infinity. Uh, D, let's say u over one plus u squared to the power of three two. Mm, yeah, with the u, with c being with the u being equal to z over d. Okay, so in the end, the def the total deflection is minus gm over b and then there's an integral over here uh yeah i don't think we'll waste our time on calculating this integral you can do it yourselves uh there is a couple of ways to calculate it but the final result is very simple this integral is just two This is equal to two. Okay. And because of that, we can now calculate our formula for the gravitational deflection of light over here. Uh, So Px turn out to be equal to minus four G M over B P Z zero. And because of that, it's easy to check that the theta, the deflection angle is roughly four G M over B. And if we reintroduce the speed of light, the deflection angle is four g m b over c squared. Okay, and that's the textbook formula for the deflection of light uh, by a spherically symmetric massive body uh, in the Newtonian approximations. Do you have any question to the derivation? If not, then I will go back to the slides. Okay, so here's the formula we have derived. It was already derived by Einstein very shortly after he introduced his uh, general relativity. Uh, this is again a fairly small angle because c is again you have this square of this of the speed of light in the denominator on the other hand you also have mass uh, in the numerator so for sufficiently big masses this can be uh, this can attain relatively big values and there is also b it's obvious that the deflection is larger when the when the light passes very close to the deflecting body so how big is this is this effect really so for the sun for a grazing ray so a ray which which almost touches the the photosphere uh, that's about 1.7 arc seconds arc second is, is is a measurement of angle if you're not aware of that uh, in which we take one degree uh, divided into 16 60 minutes and then divide again into 60 arc seconds 1.7 to our arc seconds this is a relatively small angle but not a, 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 but not a disastrously small angle uh, for the next uh, for the jupiter which is the the, the next body of uh, which is another very heavy body in the solar system second only to sun this is much less than that it's only one hundredth of, of of this effect in comparison the stellar aberration effect because of the earth motion uh, around the uh, around the solar system is about 20 arc seconds which is more than that however you see this effect was well known already in late 18th and 19th century so the total uh, the total deflection of, of of light at least for objects passing very close for light rays passing close to the sun is not so so small that you cannot really measure it in fact it was sufficiently big to be more or less measurable uh, when einstein formulated gr 
in, in fact, the first measurement of the of this effect happened uh, in 1919, shortly after World War One. Uh, an expedition of Arthur Eddington, one of the first proponents of general relativity after Einstein, measured this effect uh, during a solar eclipse. You need a solar eclipse, eclipse because you need to measure the precise position of the stars uh, whose images lie very close to the sun. And of course, it's at that time, the radio astronomy was unexistent, only optical observations were possible, and the observation had to be done during the day. And this is only possible during a total solar eclipse. By the way, nowadays, using radio astronomy and very long baseline interferometry, the solar effect of light bending is visible almost, almost over the whole celestial sphere. We measure it not only for grazing rays, but basically everywhere. Uh, there were also measurements of the deflection of light by Jupiter uh, using radio astronomical methods. So nowadays it's a relatively big and easily measurable effect. So let me show you exactly what it looks like. So imagine you've got uh, a field of stars, background stars. First, without this red mass over here, without the sun. Uh, the light travels along the light along straight lines, so we see the, an observer sees the position of the of the star to be, let's say, over here. But once uh, we switch on the mass, we, we bring a, a mass between the background stars and the observer. The light gets deflected, and the position and and the direction from which the light rate uh, appears is a bit different. The apparent position also shifts away from the uh, from this red source. And this is what it looks like uh, here. This is not in scale. This is just for illustrative purposes. Uh, this is not written in scale. I'm not showing what you see when you perform Eddington's measurements. I'm just showing you what it looks like more or less. So the closer a, a star is to, the, uh, to this mass, the more it can, its uh, image gets deflected. It gets deflected away from the mass because of the geometry you see over here. And of course, what you what you actually see is you don't actually see the the original positions usually. You, you, what you see is only the deflected ones. Okay, this deflection angle formula is actually quite important, not only because of the deflection by the sun. It's also the basis of the theory of gravitational lensing, a very important part of astronomy. So this is an uh, an effect which is seen on extragalactic scales, and it's in fact a very important field of extragalactic astronomy today. Uh, so imagine you've got a source very, very far away, probably outside our galaxy, um, uh, a source on cosmological distances, and between you, the observer, and the source, uh, there is a heavy, uh, there is a big mass. It can be a galaxy, a very heavy galaxy, or a cluster of galaxies. It creates its own gravitational potential, which does not have to be very deep, but it's on the other hand, very, very extensive, very large. Light gets slightly deflected in this uh, intervening potential. And even though the deflection angle is very small, the distances between the lens, the gravitational lens, this, 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 this potential and the observer and between the lens and the source are so large, then this tiny deflection amounts to a relatively large uh, transverse displacement of the photon. Uh, what, what, what does it mean? Well, it means that you will see uh, the light of these background objects deflected. Uh, and since the potential of this, uh, of this object is usually quite complicated, uh, you will also see these images uh, magnified, distorted, uh, and not only just moved around, also magnified. So the the, the total luminosity of the apparent luminosity of each of these uh, object background objects will be somewhat different than without this lens over here. Uh, and it's seen on extragalactic scale. It's a rather common phenomenon nowadays. Uh, usually, we divide gravitational lensing into two types of lensing, weak lensing and strong lensing. Weak lensing is just a displacement of, of images with a small distortion. Uh, on the other hand, strong lensing happens 
Uh, strong lensing point happens when the deflection is so large that light from one uh, source can reach the observer in more than one way. And this is a very interesting situation. It usually leads to spectacular distortions and, and, and spectacular results. Namely, you can see more than one image of one single source. This is known as the multiple imaging. It is only possible when the deflection is large enough or when the distances between lens and observer and lens and the source are big enough that you can have more than one uh, geodesic starting from the source and reaching the observer. Uh, here is a couple of, of uh, images of gravitational lensing I found online, mostly from NASA. Uh, what you see here is a galaxy cluster. These, these yellow uh, dots are, are galaxies forming a bo gravitationally bound object, which is fairly heavy. On the other hand, the bluish distorted ones are background galaxies, much fainter. Note that you can visibly see that they are distorted, stretched into, into thin lines. Uh, they don't look this way. It is the stretching because of the light bending in, in the gravitational field of the galaxy cluster over here. Uh, if the gravitational field of this massive object, this, the lens, is, is uh, sufficiently sym spherically symmetric, uh, and if the body, if the alignment between the observer and the body is, 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 and the lens is almost perfect, you see a very spectacular uh, type of lensing, namely you see an arc or even an Einstein ring around the body. So the background object is distorted into a ring or at least into a luminous arc. And here on the last figure, uh, I show you multiple imaging. These are images of quasars. Uh, quasars are very distant and very luminous objects, which are also by cosmological standards, very, very small. Uh, Basically, this, these are very luminous centers of, of very distant galaxies. Uh, this sh uh, shining, uh, they are powered by accreting black holes. And the size of, of, of these shining dots is only of the size of the solar system or slightly larger, which is by extra galactic astronomy standards, very, very small. So you can easily consider them point sources. Now you see that because of the presence of some kind of heavy body, we see not one, but four or even more uh, images of, of, of the same quasar. You can confirm by spectroscopy that this is not different quasars uh, appearing to be one next to the other. This is the same quasar just seen uh, more, than, uh, more than once. Uh, a bit of history of the gravitational lensing. Uh, so it was already predicted by Einstein in 1916. Um, or at least the deflection of light. Uh, however, strong lensing was, uh, when it comes to strong lensing, it was proposed by other people. Uh, and not very well known physicist Folson uh, uh, proposed that something like this is possible in 1924. Then Czech engineer Mandel, together with Einstein, worked on, on strong gravitational lensing in 1960, 1930s. Together also, uh, independently, uh, Swiss astronomer Zwicky wrote a couple of fundamental papers on when gravitational lensing may be visible. Uh, but no observations were made at that time. The topic was revived in 1960s, like other topics in GR by Liebes and Revsdal. Revsdal, by the way, realized that the times of arrival between different uh, multiple images are, are is a little bit different. So you will see uh, if if the source is variable, you will see a delay uh, be, in this variability between different images. And in fact, Restal realized that you can measure the Hubble parameter if you if you manage to measure this differences in times of arrival. The general theory of lensing was later derived by Burasa, Cook, Kantowski, and many other people. Uh, there is two ways in which you can approach this. The first one and the simpler one is simply to use the gravitational light deflection formula we have derived as the starting point. Then you consider the, the deflection by a, uh, by a relatively narrow a variation of gravitational potential and you arrive at the lensing theory. Another one makes use of the Fermat principle, 
basically, uh, you assume that the light travels uh, along lines which minimize the or extremize the time of arrival. They are completely equivalent. The first observation of, of strong lensing happened only in 1979. Uh, and then the observations of giant luminous arcs, that's 1980s. Uh, on top of that, there's also the micro lensing. So lens, lensing by uh, lensing of distant stars or quasars by uh, objects uh, in our galaxy, small, invisible, heavy objects in our in our galaxy, which happened to cross uh, our line of sight when we were watching an, a distant quasar. We are not able to resolve the image itself. It's too small, but microlensing causes a, a, a change in the apparent luminosity of, of, of the body. Uh, it's a relatively well understood phenomenon and can be used to, to, to measure the number of uh, small and massive types of, of objects in our galaxy. Okay, gravitational lensing has a lot of applications. Uh, you can measure the total mass at, and the mass distribution of the lens if you if you are able to uh, measure the distortion of images. Uh, you can also measure the Hubble constant uh, if you have multiple imaging of quasars. Uh, yeah, and it's worth another lecture basically, but this is where we will end in, 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 in this lecture. So do you have any questions to gravitational lensing? Uh, I have a question. Can I ask? Yes, go on. Yes, sure, go on. Yeah. So the thing is that uh, with respect to the gravity, like when we saw the formalism of gravitational lensing, also mm -hmm. people during the period of, uh, during this period when they were defining this formalism, they were also trying to do it with Newtonian mechanics where they were purely considering Newton's equation. They were not considering GR at all. Mm -hmm. And at that time, they got a factor of like a factor of two, like less. Yes. Or, yeah. So is there true. a very specific reason for that? Okay. So thank you very much for this question. So indeed, in principle, you can you can try to uh, you can try to approach the gravitational deflection of light from entirely Newtonian perspective, forgetting any GR just assuming that photons are ordinary particles moving at the speed of light. But other than that, undergoing just acceleration in the gravitational field the same way any other particle does. And in that case, you also get a deflection formula, but this deflection formula differs by a factor of two. You get two gm over bc squared instead of four gm over bc squared. I understand the question is, why is it the case? Uh, Okay, let me maybe go back to the notes. Uh, share screen. So let's go back to the derivation. Mm. I think the difference can be seen in this formula over here. So if you try to treat the the uh, a null particle the same way you, you, you treat a massive one, what you get here is just one single derivative with respect to, uh, you, you get only one single phi i minus phi i term. Let's have a look at the massive particle case again. Yes, so in a massive particles, <clears throat> you can neglect the velocity, uh, all the terms which are quadratic in velocity, and you end up just with the one, one gradient of phi times the mass uh, as the derivative of the spatial part of, of for momentum or the derivative of the momentum. On the other hand, in photons, you should not neglect that. Pk is of the same order as, as P0, and because of that, this term is not negligible with respect to that one. And in fact, you get minus two, the gradient of phi. And that's the difference. So forgetting about the relativity means that you forget about this term over here and also 
probably this term over there. And you get wrong equation of motion. I think this is the difference. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have four more minutes, so let me go. Let's at least begin the gravitation, the next topic, gravitational waves. Okay, so gravitational waves are a completely new field in astronomy. Mm. Let me switch on the pointer. Okay, I have problems with switching on the pointer. I don't know why. Okay, doesn't matter. Uh, so it's a new field in gravitational, it's a new field uh, of astronomy. Uh, gravitational waves are basically small distortion of space-time propagating with the speed of light. They're predicted by GR, but they have no Newtonian analog, unlike uh, unlike everything we, we, we were discussing so far. Even gravitational light bending has some Newtonian analog, although it gives you the wrong magnitude of the effect. So this is the first truly GR effect, which which has no which was not known before. They tend to be very difficult to observe, mainly because the gravitational uh, interactions are very weak, and because of that, uh, the it takes a very big mass to create gravitational waves, and it takes a very precise measurement to see the effects of these gravitational waves. In fact, only astrophysical sources are sufficiently heavy to produce any kind of gravitational wave we may ever be able to measure. So uh, the sources we consider nowadays are mainly binary systems. So systems of two black holes orbiting each other or two neutron stars or the combination of a black hole and a neutron star. Uh, towards the end of its life, uh, they undergo they get closer and closer to each other and at some point they undergo measure a merger during this merger phase the emission of gravitational waves is very strong and this is the type of gravitational waves we are able to measure on top of that people thought about the asymmetric neutron stars neutron stars are very heavy objects of the mass of a couple of solar masses uh, composed of rather exotic matter uh, and spinning very very fast if there is an asymmetry in their uh, in their geometry this will also lead to the emission of gravitational waves. Uh, <clears throat> some types of supernovae may probably also uh, produce gravitational waves. And on top of that, there are also waves which might have been produced in the early stages of the universe. People were also looking for those, uh, but they were not directly uh, measured so far. Uh, the theory of gravitational waves was uh, derived first by Einstein. There was a lot of controversies whether the gravitational waves are real. At the linear order, as we will discuss them today, they are not controversial, but when you want to pass to exact solutions which um, describe gravitational waves, this is a bit harder. This is mathematically tricky. It's easy to, to, to notice fake singularities. Uh, it took some time to convince physicists that the gravitational waves are real. Uh, in the 1960s, uh, Weber was the first person who tried to measure them um, using so-called re re resonant uh, mass uh, detectors. The first indirect observations happened in the 1970s, where uh, two astrophysicists, radio astronomers, discovered a system of two pulsars. Pulsars are stars which emit uh, periodically light with very stable frequency. They, they found a system where two pulsars were orbiting on a very close orbit, and it was confirmed that this system was slowly losing energy at a rate which is entirely consistent with the uh, rate of gravitational wave emission. Gravitational wave, like any other waves, uh, carry away energy from a system like that, and this loss of energy was observed. Direct observation of gravitational waves happened in, only in 2015. It was from a binary black hole merger. After that, a larger number of det detections were done by, by many other ground-based detectors. And moreover, this year, uh, four teams 
uh, observing, uh, performing precise timing of pulsars, uh, reported the observations of the stochastic background of gravitational waves. We'll talk more in detail about these observations. Uh, and in the next lecture, we'll begin by deriving the uh, gravitational waves formalism in uh, linearized gravity. Uh, we'll discuss methods of measurements and, and uh, types of sources, but this will be after the winter break in January. Uh, I think this is enough for the lecture. Do you have any questions to this part of the, of the lecture? I don't hear any. So, um, well, see you on January the 9th then. Thank you very much.